So if you remember, for any reaction, we can calculate or they can give you a delta G, um, which is the Gibbs free energy. And a lot of times you might see this little degree sign next to it. That degree sign stands for standard state conditions, because typically if we're performing a lab, those are the conditions that we're going to be performing it under. It's 25 degrees Celsius, which is room temperature, one atmosphere pressure. So if you're calculating partial pressures, you're, you know, with gases, let's say you're using one ATM for your partial pressures, um, air or one molar concentration. As a heads up, at other conditions, delta G would be different. So if you change the temperature, you change the pressure, you change the concentrations you're using, you're actually going to get a different delta G. And there's a whole equation you can use to calculate what that delta G is, but it's not really on the AP exam, so we're not going to worry about it. Okay. Um, if we think about standard state conditions, okay, notice we said that's a one molar concentration. So what is your quotient or Q? And if you don't know what quotient or Q is, you might pass video about that first. Um, what would your Q be um, if you're using one molar concentrations? Well, if you plug into your equilibrium constant expression with ones as your concentration, one raised to any power is one divided by any one raised to any powers, it's all still one. So the quotient is always going to be one. Um, your initial conditions are one if you're starting if you're at standard state because all your concentrations are one molar. If you're talking in terms of partial pressures, those are one as well. If you're talking about Kp. Or QP. Um, so you're going to see a lot of us relating things to one, and that's because at standard state conditions, Q is one. Okay, so let's re recall a couple things about delta G. If delta G is negative, um, what does that mean about the reaction? That means that your reaction is thermodynamically favorable or spontaneous in the forward direction. So if you see a delta G being negative, that means you're actually going in the forward direction. So you wouldn't be at equilibrium. Okay, um, and if delta G is positive, it means we're going in the reverse direction. Um, you're not, it's not thermodynamically favorable going forward, but it would actually be favorable in reverse. So the sign is going to tell us the direction that your, your reaction is going to be going in until you reach equilibrium. Okay, um, so as we said, delta G negative, you're going to be moving forward. It's thermodynamically favorable going forward. And if you're going forward, you are creating product. Let's think about our equilibrium constant expression. Product is in the numerator. So as you go forward and you're creating more product, your, your ratio of product over reactants raised to the power of this, the coefficient, or equilibrium constant, it's going to end up being a pretty big value by the time you get to equilibrium. Um, so it would make sense that your K is actually going to be a lot bigger than 1. And we had said if you have a really large K, that means you have mostly product at equilibrium, which makes sense because if you're going forward to get to equilibrium, you're going to end up with more product. We can also think of it as we said if, hey, if Q is less than K, right, that must mean that we are going in the forward direction so that we can raise that numerator and bring down that denominator. Um, and at standard state conditions, Q is 1. So that must mean if we're going forward, that K is bigger than 1. It's another way of thinking of it. Um, but really, what I want you to take away here is the logic that anytime delta G is negative, we're going to get a pretty large K, K bigger than 1. If delta G is negative, that means it's going forward. If K is bigger than 1, that means I have mostly product at equilibrium. Those totally relate to each other because if you're going forward, you're creating product until you get to equilibrium. And that's why when you get to equilibrium, you have more product than reactant. Totally makes sense. So in and opposite, delta G is positive. We said it's not thermodynamically favorable going forward, but it is in reverse. So you're actually going to be going in the reverse direction until you reach equilibrium. You're going to be creating reactant, and you're going to keep creating reactant until you reach equilibrium. So by the time you get to equilibrium, you're going to have a lot more reactant than product. So your K is going to be a small number. You're going to have you know, a much larger denominator than numerator. K is going to be less than 1. And this is all logic that you can think through, but they, they love to ask you on the AP the relationship between delta G and K. Negative delta G, big K. Positive delta G, small K. Okay, and if delta G is zero, that means there's no driving force going forward or reverse. That means you're at equilibrium and your K is equal to one if you're at standard state conditions. Okay, so the magnitude, we didn't really talk too much about magnitude before, but the magnitude of, of delta G can also tell you how far you are away from equilibrium to start with. 
Um, so the larger your magnitude of delta G, and delta G gets, you know, whether positive or negative, the bigger this number gets, that means the further it is from equilibrium, the more the reaction is going to have to proceed forward or reverse until we get to equilibrium. So that means K is going to be much, much further from Q, you know, from your starting values. Um, and if you, it's at standard state, that means your starting values are zero. So that means your K is going to be much, much further from one. So a really nice chart to kind of sum this up is right here, um, actually taken from our textbook. Um, and as you see here, if delta G is zero, K is one if we're at standard state because we're looking at this little degree sign. As delta G gets really more and more and more negative, look at what happens to K. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it kind of makes sense because if delta G is really, really negative, that means that I'm going in the forward direction and K is much further than Q. It's going to be going in the forward direction for a while until I reach equilibrium. Um, or it's going to be going in the forward direction to such a large extent that by the time I get to equilibrium, I'm going to have mostly product and barely any reactant. And remember, at equilibrium, we need both reactant and products. So neither of them is zero, but I have mostly products here. And as D delta G gets really, really positive, the bigger this number, the more and more and more and more smaller K is, the further and further it is from one. So again, um, I'm going in the reverse reaction to such an extent that by the time I get to equilibrium, I have so much more reactant than product. So notice that K is much, much smaller than one when delta G is very, very positive. K is much, much bigger than one when delta G is negative. Okay, um, we could also prove this mathematically. Um, so just showing you, on your AP Chem formula sheet, when you were doing thermo, you might have seen that there is another equation relating delta G to K, and we just learned about K here. So um, you can always calculate delta G or K if given the other, and we're going to reference this equation. Um, you can just prove mathematically what we literally just talked about. Um, so let's talk about this logically, and then we'll talk about um, plugging in um, to get that number. So just a few, since we saw a natural log in that equation, the ln of a number bigger than one is positive. So anytime you take the natural log um, of any number bigger than one, you get a positive number. If you take the natural log of a number less than one, you're going to get a negative number. So like the natural log of 0.5 is negative 0.693. The larger the number, the larger the natural log. So natural log of 60 is bigger than the natural log of 6. So just a few math tips um, for what we're talking about next. So at equilibrium, here's the equation. I just took off the formula sheet. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this. So if I want delta G to be negative, less than zero, meaning I want a thermodynamically favorable reaction going forward, let's talk about K, right? Notice I have this negative sign. R is a constant, it's positive. T is a Kelvin temperature, so it's always positive, never negative. So in order to get a negative delta G, I'd want the natural log of K to be a positive number because if it's negative, it would negate with that negative, right, to keep delta G negative. So that means for delta G to be negative, K has to be a number bigger than one, because we just said a number bigger than one would give you a, po taking the natural log would give you a positive number. So that means if delta G is negative, K is bigger than one, both of those things mean the reaction would go forward. So whether you see K being bigger than one or delta G being negative, both of those now mean that it's thermodynamically favorable going forward. They should have seen this inside. Okay, um, and therefore, if delta G is bigger than zero, for delta G to be a positive number, that means the natural log of K should be a negative number, so the two negatives cancel out. And therefore, um, that would mean in either way, whether I say delta G is positive or K is much less than one, the reaction would go in reverse. So this is just mathematically proving what we just talked about logically on the last slide. So I don't care if you want to think of it logically or mathematically, they totally agree with each other, okay? And if delta G is zero, the only thing that would give me a zero here is if the natural log of K is zero. And if you plug in, if you try it in your calculator, the natural log of one is zero. So that would give me a delta G of zero, and that means that I'm at equilibrium at standard state conditions. Okay, and just remember that term thermodynamically favorable means the products are favored at equilibrium. So I could say negative delta G is thermodynamically favorable, or now I could also say K being bigger than one is thermodynamically favorable going forward. 
And thermodynamically unfavorable means my delta G is positive or that my K is much less less than 1. Both of those things are true if it's thermodynamically fav unfavorable going forward, but thermodynamically favorable in reverse. Okay, now let's just talk about using this equation um, if we're actually plugging in. Um, so remember that the units of delta G are typically kilojoules per mole. That's usually what they ask for. If they don't specify, you could do joules per mole, but usually it's kilojoules per mole. So we see this negative. Don't forget to bring that negative in because a lot of people forgot to forget to copy it. R is our ideal gas constant. And if you go to your formula sheet, um, and you go up to this section, here's R's. And a lot of times we're used to using these two bottom two over here, but notice the units are liters, atmospheres, liters, tor. Like how can we get into energy units? Oh, well, wait a minute, here's this R that rather than having volume pressure, they have energy units per mole Kelvin. So this is the one that we're gonna be using. This is why plugging in with units is super helpful. So don't forget to plug in with units when you're doing a calculation. This is the R you wanna use, the 8.314, okay? So we're gonna use this 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. Notice it's per Kelvin. So that means the temperature you plug in should also be Kelvin. So the Kelvins cancel out, okay? Um, and then just notice, um, and, and don't forget K is unitless. So it's not going to contribute to the units anywhere. Um, and then just remember that if they ask for delta G in kilojoules, um, sometimes you'll have a conversion to do. Or if you're solve, if they get, you know, if they're giving you delta G in kilojoules and you're solving for K, make sure the kilojoules and you know this is joules, they're not going to cancel. You might have to convert one of them. So please just be aware of units, plug in with units, and make sure they cancel the way that you want them to. And sometimes they might ask you to solve for K given a delta G. And don't forget to do that. You could divide both sides by negative RT. And then to get rid of the LN, you could take E to the both sides. And this is the equation rearranged for that. Um, it's not on your formula sheet. If you find it helpful to memorize, feel free. But I just derive it on the spot using algebra. Okay. Um, and just a reminder that just because delta G is largely negative doesn't mean that the forward reaction is happening fast, okay? Or if K is much bigger than one, doesn't mean it's happening quickly. This has nothing to do with the speed. It's only saying that it will go forward if it's delta G is negative and K bigger than one. And by the time you get to equilibrium, you'll have a lot more product than reactant. So it's not implying anything about the speed. Um, sometimes you're thermodynamically favorable, but they go very, very slowly, especially if you have a high activation energy. It takes, that's a common reason why it might go slowly. Um, and um, if it's not occurring very quickly, we say it's under kinetic control rather than thermodynamic um, control. Okay, um, take a moment, try this example, uh, and then check your work. So it says calculate delta G. Don't forget you can, you know, if we go back to these equations here, you can still use this equation to calculate delta G if you can get delta H and delta S. Um, so if I do that, my delta, H, they give me heats of formation. I can do products minus reactants, um, and I get negative 6.4 kilojoules per mole. If you have trouble doing this, see my past video on thermodynamics um, and, and, and delta G. Um, and here's my delta S. They give me, you know, the entropies for each of these substances. Same thing, products minus reactants. And when you're plugging into that delta G equation, you should notice that this is kilojoules, but this is joules. So I'm going to have to change one of them. Since typically delta G we record in kilojoules, I always tend to change the, the delta S. But if I plug in, here's my delta G minus T should be in Kelvin. So the Kelvins cancel out. And I've taken this divided by 1,000 to turn to kilojoules and I get positive 2.5 kilojoules per mole. Is it spontaneous or thermodynamically favorable going forward? No, it's actually thermodynamically favorable in reverse direction. What can I expect about K? Since delta G is positive, I can expect K to be a number less than one. And actually, let's try to calculate that next. So take a moment, try, check your work logically, um, and then check against here. So let's calculate K. So I, now I can use this equation, delta G equals negative R T L N K. Um, I'm just going to rearrange right now, bring the negative, you know, a negative R T to the other side. Don't lose track of that negative. A lot of people forget about it or lose it somewhere. Um, and then when I plug in, notice that my, my delta G is in kilojoules. This is why I always say plug in with units. My R is in joules. 
So I've got to convert that to kilojoules or convert this delta G to joules, whichever way you're more comfortable. But that's why I added this conversion factor. And here's my Kelvin temperature. And I get that my natural log of K is negative 1. So to get rid of this natural log, I'm going to raise both sides to the E power, um, you know, E to that power, the, the LN and the E cancel out. So basically in my calculator, I'm just doing E raised to the negative 1, and I get 0.36, which makes sense because we said delta G was positive. It wasn't like a super big positive number, so K didn't drift that far from 1, and that makes sense as well.